Rust 1.74.0 was released today, November 16th, 2023, thanks to the hard work of hundreds of contributors. First off, I need to address a mistake I made last time in my Rust 1.73 announcement. We'll call this number zero. Maybe old number 20, because I said last time in my number 20 update that Cargo Help had colorized output, but alas, I was off by one version. Fortunately, one version later, this is now true. So all that cool colored output is now available on Stable. Enjoy. Now for number one. This is also a cargo feature, yet another one implemented by Ed Page. Thanks, Ed. By the way, if anyone else wants to be credited by name, username, and or picture for your hard work that I cover, just contact me. I credit Ed because I know him. I know his username, I have a picture of him, and I know he's okay being credited for his work. If you want me to credit you too, just let me know. Now let's talk about this lint configuration feature. This feature was described in RFC 3389 and basically boils down to support in cargo.toml for lints sections to define what lint levels you want to change across your entire project. The lints.rust section is for lints built into the Rust C compiler itself, and the lints.clippy section is for clippy lints. The syntax is pretty simple. Put the name of the lint on the left, and then in quotes, put the level you want for the lint on the right. There are four lint levels you can choose from. Allow ignores the lint entirely. Warn emits a warning but lets compilation succeed. Deny emits an error and causes compilation to fail that can be overridden in the source code on a case-by-case -case basis with a warn or allow lint level attribute. And finally, forbid also emits an error that causes compilation to fail but cannot be overridden in the source code. There's even workspace support. So if you have a workspace like this, you can add your lint sections like this, which look just the same, except now the section names are prefixed with workspace. And then in your crates cargo.toml, you just put a lints section with workspace equals true to inherit the workspace settings. Easy. Number two, self and associated types are now allowed in opaque return types. What does that mean? Well, opaque return types include any return from an async function or the generic item inside an infiltrate in return position. By the way, if you ever run into the RPIT acronym, it stands for return position infiltrate, which is a fancy way of saying returning an infiltrate like this. Anyway, you can now use self in these returns, which is super nice. You can also use associated types in the same situation. Overall, a good improvement. Number three, the minimum versions Rust supports of various Apple operating systems has been raised. The oldest macOS version supported is now macOS 10.12 Sierra. The oldest iOS version supported is now iOS 10. And the oldest tvOS supported is now tvOS 10. All three of these were released in 2016, which means Rust is supporting Apple's operating systems quite a bit longer than Apple itself. Number four, the private in public lint has been replaced with two new lints, private interfaces and private bounds. The difference is fully described in RFC 2145. There's a link in the description below, but after spending 45 minutes reading the RFC, I realized it would take a long time to describe the nuances of the changes to you. So I will just summarize by saying some really smart folks put in a ton of work to make the lint less confusing and warn about more cases. Also, the lint is now a warning instead of a hard error, so that's nice too. Number five, the documentation for standard mem discriminant was updated to clarify that the value of an enum discriminant does not change when the value of a lifetime parameter changes. What does that really mean? Let's walk through it. Here's an enum named my enum that has a lifetime parameter tick a and two variants, nothing, which is a unit variant, and ref vector, which holds a reference to a vector of integers over the lifetime tick a. A discriminant is kind of like an ID number that the compiler assigns to each variant to keep them straight. The updated documentation clarifies that the value of an enum discriminant does not change when the value of a lifetime parameter changes. So no matter what we name the lifetime parameter, the discriminants remain the same. Number six, you are now allowed to put an explicit repr rust attribute in front of your structs. 
You have long been able to use the wrapper attribute to specify that you want to lay out your struct to be compatible with C. And you could also specify a specific alignment or that you wanted a packed representation without any padding. But until now, the only way to specify that you wanted to use the default Rust alignment was to leave out the C alignment. The problem with this is that sometimes humans or even linters assume that you actually meant to specify C alignment. And that can lead to problems when they start helpfully changing it for you. Now you can be explicit that you want to use the default Rust layout, and that should help prevent linters and pesky coworkers from making bad assumptions. Number seven, a bug has been fixed. How a closure captured a public field from a packed struct depended on the alignment of that public field. Hey, we just talked about how to configure the alignment in packed attributes. But that public field's alignment could change if a private field in the struct changed which means a private change could affect public behavior. This is a corner case that probably didn't affect many people, but it's fixed now. Number eight, MIR-based drop tracking for async blocks has been enabled. MIR stands for Mid-Level Intermediate Representation, which is a phase in the compiler after HIR, which stands for High-Level Intermediate Representation. These are both phases in the Rust compiler pipeline, and until now, the drop tracking for async blocks was kind of being done in HIR and then kind of being redone in MIR. Now the whole thing is done in the MIR phase, reducing some complexity, deduplicating some work, and hopefully just all around better. Number nine. Rust supports some command line arguments called link modifiers, which tweak the way linking native libraries works. The link modifier plus bundle means objects from the static library are bundled into the produced crate and are then used from this crate later during linking of the final binary. The link modifier plus whole archive means that the static library is linked as a whole archive without throwing any object files away. Up until now, you could only specify one or the other, but now you can specify both together. Number 10, the compiler command line flag dash dash print can now accept a path in its kind equals argument. Kind is one of the supported emit kinds and path is literally a path to a file on the file system. So actually using this option would look something like this, where asm is the kind and path to assembly.s is the path. Number 11, Apple's address sanitizer tool, asan, leak sanitizer tool, lsan, and thread sanitizer tool, tsan, are now enabled for all of the platforms ending in Apple iOS Mac ABI, which is all of the iOS hardware simulators that run on Mac OS. Go, go, Apple tooling. Number 12, three new platforms are supported in this release. Let's take a look. In tier two platform support, we have two more 64-bit Chinese Lungsun MIPS processors, one that apparently relies on software for floating point numbers. Fun fact, Lungsun is Chinese for Dragon Core. I'm sure that I'm mispronouncing it. Sorry about that, I don't speak Chinese yet. In tier three, we have another Windows target, apparently intended for the MSYS2 folks in some fashion. Number 13, this begins our stabilized API section. First up to be stabilized, core num saturating. This is a new generic struct that wraps any integer type and makes it use saturating arithmetic by default instead of overflowing or panicking by default. Saturating is a tuple struct wrapping an integer. You can access the underlying value using the dot zero tuple index. This example shows how if you try to overflow a U32, it just saturates at the max value. Number 14, a whole bunch of standard IO stuff. Impl from IO standard out and standard air for standard IO. This makes it easy to redirect standard out to standard air and stuff like that. Next, we have trait implementations that make it easy to convert an owned file descriptor or an owned handle to a child standard in, a child standard out, or a child standard air. Once again, this is helpful if you want to hook up a file to a child process's input or output streams. Number 15. Some methods for converting operating system string types to or from encoded bytes have been stabilized. Specifically, we've got new methods to create an OS string and OS stir from encoded bytes unchecked. And we've got new methods to convert an OS string or OS stir into encoded bytes. Number 16. There is a new associated function to generate a generic IO error with an error kind of other. Calling IO errors other method is the same as manually calling IO errors new method and passing it an error kind other. 
Number 17. You can now try to convert a care into a U16. This will succeed if the code point for the character is a small enough number to fit in a U16. Otherwise, you will get a result error. Number 18. You can now create a vector directly from a reference to a fixed sized array. As long as the array's type implements the clone trait, you can now convert from a fixed sized array to a vector due to these new trait implementations that take advantage of const generics to implement the conversion for immutable and mutable references. This was already possible by first taking a slice of the array and then converting that. But now you don't have to go through that extra step. Number 19. You can now convert a fixed sized array directly to a reference counted array through another two from trait implementations that, once again, take advantage of const generics. This conversion already worked for box pointers, and now it works for arc and rc reference counting pointers too. Number 20. Three APIs that were already stable are now also available to use in const contexts. Here they are. Let's go through them. The first is transmute copy. This unsafe API will take a reference and ignore the type of the reference and copy it into another destination with the type you tell it. This is super useful when dealing with FFI and C libraries, and now you can do it at compile time. The next is stir is ASCII, which reads the contents of a stir and tells you whether or not it is entirely made up of ASCII characters. And the third one is the exact same is ASCII method, but on a slice of U8 instead of a stir. Number 21. Cargo, when used as a Rust library instead of a command line tool, now specifies an MSRV, or Minimum Supported Rust version. For Rust 1.74, Cargo, as a library, supports Rust 1.71.1 and above. Number 22. Cargo changes how arrays and configs are merged. This change was thoroughly explained in an August 24th blog post to the Inside Rust blog. A link is in the description below. The summary is that if you have complicated setups with multiple layers of config files and command line options changing the same options in different ways, then you might see a different option from a different place after this change. If you have a simple setup like most of us, you're not going to notice any changes. Number 23, the dash dash aggressive option for cargo update has been renamed to dash dash recursive, which more clearly describes what is going on. The dash dash aggressive option now aliases to dash dash recursive to avoid breaking any existing workflows that may be using it. Number 24. The dash p in the cargo update command is now optional. What does that mean? Cargo update has long had the ability to specify a single package to update with the dash p flag. The thing is, why not just let people do cargo update my package instead? It makes sense, so they made it happen. Number 25. Cargo command line options now allow incomplete version numbers wherever it makes sense, just like you could already do in cargo.toml. So, for example, you could say that you want to update a specific package to version 5, and Cargo will figure out the actual full version number that you should have right now, just like it would do if you put the version 5 in cargo.toml. Number 26. Cargo has stabilized support for authenticated private registries. That's the registry auth part, along with a way for an authentication token to be securely stored by a credential provider. That's the credential process part. This is the first time Cargo has stable support for private authenticated registries. See the Cargo login man page for more info. A link is in the description below. Number 27. All of the Cargo commands that have a dash dash dry run option now have a dash n short alias for doing a dry run, because everyone kind of expects that. Awesome. Number 28. You can now use a config expression in a target section to specify the linker you want to use. For example, here's a target section with a config expression configuring some linker to be used if we're not on the AVR architecture. Number 29. There is a new dash dash keep going flag, which is basically the opposite of a fail fast flag. Whenever cargo is building things, like for cargo build or cargo run, dash dash keep going makes it so that if something fails to compile, cargo keeps going and compiles as much of the rest of the stuff as it can before it stops. Number 30. Have you ever been writing documentation and wanted to put a big warning about something that people might actually notice? I have. Well, now there's a syntax for it in your doc comments. Add a div with a warning class, and don't forget to close it at the end. And then when you generate your docs, like I taught you in Ultimate Rust 2, you'll get a nicely emphasized warning in your documentation. 
Cool. Number 31. Documentation comments now have syntax to specify that code in triple backticks should use custom CSS styling that you will provide in a separate file. See the link in the description below for more details if you're interested because this is a Rust video, not a web front end video, and I am not going to talk about CSS. Number 32. Rustdoc gained the ability to search by type signature not too long ago, but that didn't work very well when the types were generic. Now it works better. For example, what takes an option of an option of some type and returns just an option of that type? The flatten method. Go give it a try. Number 33. Documentation for type aliases of enums was kind of messy. It talked about inner this and inner that. Well, now the enum aliases documentation looks a lot more like the actual enums documentation. Number 34. Cell swap assumed no one would ever try to swap cells that overlapped in memory. Turns out, people will do all sorts of things, which is why cell swap now panics if you try to swap cells that overlap in memory. Number 35. The Rust C compiler's dash dash extern flag now requires the library to be specified using valid ASCII characters. That seems sensible. Number 36. Now we're into new clippy lints. The worn by default redundant as stir lint checks for usage of as stir on a string that is immediately chained with a method already available on string itself. Just call the method on the string. Number 37. The worn by default needless borrows for generic args lint checks for when you borrow a value to pass to a generic function that would have worked with the value itself. Instead, just use the value itself. Number 38. The worn by default path ends with ext lint looks for calls to path ends with that look like they're looking for an extension. This is bad because path ends with only considers whole path components like whole directory names and whole file names, so it won't match on an extension. Instead, you need to call path extension and examine the option that returns. Number 39. The worn by default unnecessary map on constructor lint suggests removing the use of map or map error while creating an option or a result. That's just unnecessarily complicated. Instead, just make the thing you want and put it straight into the option or result. Number 40. The allow by default missing asserts for indexing lint checks for repeated slice indexing without asserting that the length is greater than the largest index used to index into the slice. This is bad because the compiler will actually insert runtime checks before each index operation if it can't see something already doing the checking. If you add a single assert beforehand, the compiler will probably check that just once and not generate checks for each of the index operations immediately afterwards. Well, if the compiler does what we expect anyway. This is marked as an allow by default lint, meaning it won't even show up unless you enable it because it's hard to predict that the compiler will actually behave like we think it will during the optimization phase. So if you enable this lint, you should probably check that fixing it actually speeds things up. Number 41, the worn by default iter out of bound lint looks for iterator combinator calls such as take or skip, where the amount provided is greater than the amount of items the iterator will produce. In the case of take, this is a no op. In the case of skip, this produces an empty iterator. So just, don't do that. Number 42. The allow by default implied bounds in impulse lint looks for bounds in return position impl trait. Remember the RPIT acronym we talked about earlier? Here it is. Okay, sorry. So this lint looks for when you're doing the RPIT thing with more bounds than you actually need. So in this example, if something implements deref mute, then it has to implement deref mute's parent trait deref. So you don't have to write them both out, just the one that covers everything. Number 43. The worn by default reserve after initialization lint looks for when you create a vector and then immediately reserve capacity and tells you to just create the vector with that capacity from the start. Number 44. The last new lint today is the allow by default should panic without expect lint that warns you if you mark a test as should panic, but don't tell should panic what panic message you should expect. Honestly, I didn't even know should panic could accept an argument, so that was cool to learn. Speaking of learning, if you've been meaning to learn Rust, come take my ultimate Rust crash course online. I'll take you from zero to understanding the fundamentals in about four hours or so. It's fun, entertaining, interactive, and I will answer any questions you have. Sign up at ultimaterustcourses.com. A link is in the description. Like and subscribe if you want more videos like this.